So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Nicole Preisel. I am Stolo from Lacamel First Nation and I also have some family heritage in Squamish Nation as well. Um, I'm coming to you from the unceded traditional and ancestral territories of the Tsleil-Waututh, Coquitlam, uh, Kwantlen, Stolo and Katsi First Nations uh, and Kikait First Nations, um, currently on Bernay Mountain. And I'm always so happy to live here, um, to be part of the, to be part of the nature and the wilderness of this land um, that I continually care for and am cared for by. Um, so thank you guys for joining. Um, today we're going to be hearing a talk from Kevin Bell, um, who I just got to know a few moments ago. It sounds like an amazing man with an amazing. Uh, past work that he's done. Um, he's going to be talking about um, Purple Martins, um, but more about him. He actually ran the Ecology Center for 25 years. Um, he was a manager for Natural Parks Land for 10 years. That's amazing. Uh, an active member of Nature Vancouver, Western Canada Nature Society. I think he said since 1978. Um, part of the BC Federation of Naturalists. Uh, set aside land, the land actually it was one of the people that helped set aside the land for the Maplewood Flats um, and devoted himself to conservation for, sounds like, for uh, many decades and um, has done many more amazing projects that I'm sure I will learn more about. And I'm just very pleased to have gotten to know him and I hope uh, we all um, enjoy his talk. And yes, um, Leanne, is there anything else you would like me to mention? I just maybe I should just mention and we can talk about it later as well but just um, uh, we're we're working to um, uh, ensure the involvement of Tsleil-Waututh in the um, in the ongoing yes. care and um, knowledge about this migrating bird population that that uh, returns every year to the nest boxes that we've that Wilbur Trust has been helping to manage for since well you'll learn uh, about the history and um, that that given that these these birds are right out front of their village site um, it's important for us to to um, involve them and uh, and and work closer with them so thank you yeah, yeah. I appreciate that all right, uh, Kevin, are you uh, ready? Sure, yeah. Awesome, thank you, take the floor. <laughs> yeah. So uh, thank you for that introduction and uh, yeah, recognizing of course we are on the unseen lands of Slave Tooth Nation, uh, who have probably been watching these purple martins in this area for many, many, years, uh, maybe thousands, uh, these birds have been doing this remarkable migration and coming back each spring in April from Brazil and the tropical rainforests of Brazil. So let's move on. <coughs> this is an artist's impression or painting of what they look like. The male is purple, a dark, purple. In bad light, it looks black. You get it in my sun, sunlight, it's uh, glossy purple. Female is brown with sort of a purplish back. And they're about seven and a half inches long. And they eat insects. They especially like dragonflies. Now, there are a number of species of swallows. The purple mines are part of the swallow family. So there are a number of species uh, in the sea that come back in summer. These are bank swallows, which nest in the interior of BC, but move through Maplewood in spring and fall on migration. Rough-winged swallows, uh, which do nest in Maplewood in very small numbers in the old barge channel. They nest in the banks of the barge channel. And you can see uh, here, I think, the yellow uh, printing points out where the little bank swallows are. Uh, <clears throat> Western swallow called the uh, violet green swallow. It, uh, it lives, uh, nests in the uh, mountains of Western North America, 
and it doesn't nest anywhere else. So it's very much a Western bird. It winters in Central and South America, nests in cavities, and we'll use nest boxes, and we'll also use holes in walls. Tree swallow, uh, nests in nest boxes, holes in trees, cavities. It's found throughout North America, comes back every spring, heads south for fall. <coughs> and this is a cliff swallow. Builds this gorgeous mud nest on the side of cliffs and buildings. There used to be good colonies at Simon Fraser University, UBC, and the uh, Maritime Museum up until the 1980s when, for hygienic reasons, they hosed them all down and destroyed the colonies, which is really a shame. Uh, these birds are protected under the Federal Migratory Birds Convention Act. So I think they probably broke the law, but they got away with it. Barn swallows are uh, found in Eurasia and North America, and they uh, migrate south in the winter and north in the spring. These are probably the swallows that most people see and think about when they think of the word swallow. Unfortunately, all of these swallows and uh, most insect bir eating birds, passerines, songbirds, are going through drastic declines now. Uh, we just had a hell of an event uh, in Arizona a few weeks ago when thousands of birds literally dropped out of the sky and they were found to be uh, star starved to death. It was probably connected with the uh, Californian Oregon fires and the hurricanes going up uh, the Mississippi. The birds got driven off course, uh, found nowhere to feed, and literally starved to death on migration. But we are doing a lot of things to these insect eating birds. We're destroying their habitat and we are poisoning them with pesticides, herbicides. Pearl martins in most of North America nest in uh, this sort of house, which people have put in their backyards, gardens, wherever. And uh, this, any, once you go east of the Rockies, this is what purple martins nest in. Uh, however, this comes from a, an interesting situation. These are imitation gourds. And this is a, an artist impression of a uh, a village in probably northern Florida uh, before probably way back uh, 1300s, 1200s, maybe earlier, where the uh, people on the coast of North America there put up gourds in their villages to encourage the martins to nest in the village. Now this may have been for several reasons. One may have been to uh, as insect control. Uh, another one could have been that they enjoyed seeing the birds nesting, and they may also have eaten the eggs or the young, who knows. Uh, but certainly this was how the Eastern population of purple martins got, uh, if you like, uh, addicted to nesting beside human beings. In Southwestern desert country, Arizona, New Mexico, the purple martins there nest in the desert in holes made by woodpeckers in the cactus, and they still do to this day. On the west coast, uh, they nested in flooded estuary forests. Uh, the floodplain of the Fraser was immense. It stretched basically from Hope right down to the ocean. It was fresh water, brackish water, and of course salt water. It was all a huge marsh. And uh, Sumas Prairie, Sumas Prairie was a huge lake. Uh, the early uh, Europeans here complained that it was subtropical and the insects were eating them alive. Uh, what happened in the floodplain forests was the uh, a lot of trees got drowned, and uh, you had dead trees with woodpecker holes in them. And that's where the purple martins nested. This is a map uh, created by the uh, Environment Canada by a lady called North Dunn and uh, Tre Trev. Can you read that, anybody? Trevor Sam. It's a, a map made in the uh, ninth, by Environment Canada by these people in the 1980s 
from the uh, log books of the surveyors who surveyed the uh, Fraser Valley in 1858 through to 1880. And they uh, wrote down the type of vegetation they were going through as they surveyed the whole area. So each of these colors represents a different type of vegetation. And for example, the uh, vegetation that's very light colored is actually grassland. And the uh, light green, uh, sort of, uh, yeah, lighter green vegetation is a floodplain forest uh, where these purple martins would have been nesting. This is just the uh, lower, you can see Lulu Island there, uh, that burns all bang in the middle, it's brown. Uh, the airport area is up the top left. So, sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt, Kevin. Just letting yeah. you know we're going on live on Facebook. Just so you know. Yes, is that okay? It's already happening. It's just we're yeah. um, coming in part way. Uh -huh. Yeah. So uh, the actually the top left hand corner would be the. Uh, 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 Slave tooth Squamish. What is the third nation? Slave tooth, Squamish, and Musqueam. That's the Musqueam, top left. Nice. Where the airport was. That's the sort of vegetation that they lived with, sort of landscape for thousands of years before the goddamn air airport destroyed the whole thing. So, uh, interesting uh, map, and it certainly uh, shows the habitat and the areas where the martens were nesting. There could well have been three. 4,000 pairs of martens in the lower Fraser Valley at that time. This is a simplified map uh, from, uh, based from a book, uh, and it shows the uh, sort of simplified area. You can see the prairie shrub mix, the actual prairie, uh, light yellow, uh, the shrub and shrub forest areas. So that's where the purple martens would have nested in the scrub and uh, shrub areas in dead standing trees with woodpecker holes. And of course that extended right to the east up the Fraser Valley along this different habitat. This is what it looked like, dead standing trees. Uh, this is where the purple martens are, are were currently found a few years ago in numbers. You see obviously Eastern North America is the uh, headquarters or the West has very few. And I think this was done before the West put up nest boxes right along the West Coast. Animals that we lost when we uh, destroyed uh, the habitat, Roosevelt elk were marketed, the huge herds of Roosevelt elk in the lower Fraser, grazing at the airport, Delta, Richmond, you name it. Uh, we slaughtered them for meat uh, for the early settlers in Vancouver, etc. So we just decimated the elk herd. They just totally wiped out. Uh, grizzly bear, the last grizzly was probably killed early 1800s in the lower mainland. And those are just two of the species. When we uh, diked and uh, drained the marshlands, we wiped out the nesting habitat for the purple martins. And uh, the, the program to bring them back started really, uh, and this is an article in Nature Vancouver's Discovery Magazine by Tom Plath. And he explains here uh, how the whole thing got going, but simplifying it in the early uh, 90s, 1990s, uh, Tom uh, contacted a number of people, including myself, and we got together and we had a number of nest boxes built and decided to put them up around the lower mainland. And uh, I remember putting up nest boxes from a yacht at high tide at Maplewood just before Christmas. And that must have been 1993. And uh, the next year, 94, they actually nested at Maplewood for the first time. So uh, quite amazing. Uh, and then they came back to various other places around the Long mainland. We've never had any trouble with starlings or house sparrows. We don't have any house sparrows at Maplewood. And we have very few starlings, so we haven't had any trouble with either of those. Uh, the only other thing to show interest in the nest boxes uh, are tree swallows, and the uh, purple martins literally kill the tree swallows if they're in there and they want to move in. It's not 
very nice. So Pearl Martins can be nasty. <laughs> uh, the males here on the left and on the right is the instructions for the nest boxes. Story I heard was that the nest boxes came out of uh, Oregon or Washington. Uh, somebody came up with the idea of putting them on the dolphins where a few, a few uh, purple martins are managing to nest in, the, in between the dolphins when they're all clumped together. Uh, there was gaps and uh, one or two pairs were still nesting there. So this uh, individual, whoever it was, came up with this idea. This is where the box design came from. And uh, very quickly spread up and down the west coast of North America, from California right up to uh, BC here. It's been very successful. Uh, there's a female with a dragonfly, favorite food. But any insects are edible as far as martins are concerned. They like termites, cotton ants, big beetles, anything that flies. They'll actually feed on the beach and the mudflats and eat those little sand poppers in the bad weather. So they are protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which covers Mexico, the United States, and Canada. And it's illegal to mess with, their, with them, generally. This map shows where they winter in purple in South America and their return to North America with the dates when they reach various areas in North America. You can see on the left-hand side, uh, 15th of April, 1st of May, they're coming back to the area around the Salish Sea. And uh, that's when we have to have the nest boxes up by. We usually take them down at this time of year and we put them back up on the dolphins uh, in April, early April. It actually lengthens the life of the nest boxes amazingly because they don't sit out in all the winter weather. And uh, we found cedar to be the best construction material for the nest boxes. Uh, this is a map of where the purple martins are in Washington State. You can see the green areas. So it gives an idea of where they were nesting there and are nesting. I think they probably expanded. The early colonies in, uh, this is probably 19, 95, 96, they were just coming back. Today, this is what the picture is. Uh, so they're really back in force, nesting in nest boxes. And they're even nesting over freshwater lakes and marshes in a few places, which is really encouraging. So we now have a really large number of these birds. Uh, I'll just read you something here. Uh, uh, in, 19, in 2014, they reckon there was over a thousand and sixty pairs nesting at uh, 74 marine and six freshwater sites in British Columbia. So that's not too bad. From it was right down to about two pairs in the early 19 in the 1990s. So brought them back from the brink of extinction, basically. A lot of people involved. There's an organization you can Google. Uh, I've just forgotten the correct name of that organization, but uh, put in Purple Martins on Google. I think you'll get it, Purple Martins in BC. Uh, so this is the sort of habitat they nest in. Uh, these log, uh, these dolphins standing out of the water are creosoted, and uh, they uh, were put there originally to hold, hold log booms. These are young purple martins at such a site, getting ready for their migration of 1,100 miles or 1,300 miles to Brazil, which they do, of course, twice a year. They go there, winter there, and then return. Quite amazing. Aerial photograph of uh, the conservation area at Maplewood. It's a Purple Martin's view of the area. So it is quite an oasis for all birds and even a few mammals in the area. There's a rather blurry photograph of volunteers putting nest boxes up at one of the sites on the west coast. Uh, on the right, uh, people putting boxes up 
I believe at Maplewood and on the left, uh, boxes already installed. We tried uh, various types. We tried treated plywood boxes, total waste of time. Uh, we tried plastic boxes, which were a waste of time. They uh, basically uh, lasted a few years and then they started, they went brittle and broke up. Plywood warped and rotted. Uh, this is a master birder on the left, uh, Derek Matthews, who banded uh, the birds at Maplewood for some years. and. Uh, in the middle is uh, Rob Lisk, and on the right is Mike Mont, two volunteers at Maplewood over the years, still volunteering. Mike looks after our log booms, shear booms, to keep garbage off the inside of plants. This young bird's been taken out of an S box, and uh, you can see this is 2004. The birds being before they're banded. Uh, Gentlemen on the right are putting the boxes back up on the dolphin. And this is Mike Mont. Uh, this is when we're bringing the bringing the uh, nest boxes in in the fall. We go out in the boat and bring in the boxes. Unfortunately, we used to. Mike had an outboard motor that he very kindly lent us to, to do this. And someone walked into his yard, his garden, and stole the goddamn motor. So anybody wants to give us an outboard motor, we really like that. Uh, June Ryder, Dr. June Ryder, she uh, ran the program for a number of years, kept track of how many boxes were used, how many birds were in there, in the years we didn't ban. We banned it for some years, then we didn't ban for some years. Uh, so. We used to uh, we go through the boxes and clean them out in October, and from that we could usually ascertain if the box was used as a nesting box by the Purple Martins. And uh, yeah, we had a program uh, where we had gone out through the summer and record birds coming and going from the boxes. We maybe did that five or six times during the breeding season, and we would be able to work out that box 50 had maybe three young birds in it, and uh, so forth. This is banding a, a young bird, and you can see this, uh, to do this, the Canadian Wildlife Service of Garden Canada demands that you take a very tough course so that uh, you do not uh, damage the birds you are working with. And uh, it's not, uh, yeah, you've got to take a course and get, uh, get us a, a license basically from Environment Canada to ban these birds and handle them and go to the boxes. Uh, if, if I went out to the box and took it down during breeding, breeding season, I could be charged uh, with disturbance and uh, under the uh, Migratory Birds Convention. So you really got to have a license to do this from Environment Canada. This is us banding the birds uh, some of oh, must be 10 or 15 years ago at Maplewood. Uh, Derek is the chap with the white hat uh, leaning over the table. Uh, on the right is Ernie Kennedy, who's been our site manager and worked at Maplewood for many years, I think since, well, it must be early 90s. And uh, I'm sitting at the table there writing down numbers, I think. So these are again purple martins and uh, what they look like, the male and female. The female is the bird on the left, rear left, and uh, saying about seven inches long. There are a few other birds, two other species that actually look like martins, they're called swifts. The bird on the right is a uh, bow swift and the bird on the left is a black swift. These are summer visitors and they do uh, frequent maple wood. So there's a few birds you can confuse uh, martins with. And this is a 1960, late 60s uh, cartoon by a cartoonist called Arkov. I think it's a rather neat cartoon. Uncle Sam is eating all the goods in those ships. And of course, this is rather good. Cheer up. They've only declared it to be a potential health hazard. They didn't say we couldn't continue to manufacture it. And that's it, folks.
Thank yeah. you so much, Kevin. That was like really good. And I'm sure I missed some stuff out, but anyway. No, I learned a lot. And um, it was really amazing to see like the charts of their migratory path for me. Um, yeah. And the dates too. And I never knew they went all the way to Brazil. So well, yeah, the amazing thing, uh, I did miss something out. Uh, the bander, uh, Derek Matthews was telling me a few weeks ago, he got a return uh, from one of the birds he banded at Maplewood. Uh, wow. I think it was the last time he banned it was uh, three years ago. Okay. And this bird, uh, he got a, a it, it had been live caught as an adult in the Squamish estuary in an S-box there. And that bird had been ringed as a chick at Maplewood, I think three years ago. It had gone to Brazil, come back, gone to Brazil and come back again in the intervening time. And uh, that was quite something because it must have covered uh, 44,000 miles at least, at least 44,000 miles wow. yeah, in those years. That, that's it's amazing. It's a 2,000 plus, uh, you know, it's a 22,000 mile trip, round trip to Brazil and back. Which is oh quite something for a seven inch long bird. That's what I was going to say. Those birds aren't that big. So. No, they ain't. No, they're really small. The, yeah, other, so the other amazing thing is they, uh, when they get to Brazil, they roost at night, not in the Amazon rainforest, but in a oil refinery. <laughs> what? Yeah. And, and, you know, you sort of, exactly, you know, you go, what? Yeah, yeah, that's what I was, that's bizarre. Yeah. When you think about it, they nest, the majority of these birds nest beside human beings in people's yeah. backyards and gardens. Exactly. You know, you and when they get to Brazil, they, if they roost in the Amazon rainforest, it's dark and there are predators, yeah, all lots. sorts of predators. If they roost in the oil refinery, human beings, yeah. they don't follow them. And there's yeah. lots of light, and they can find lots of places on the metal girders and so forth. True. So it's, yeah, it's bizarre. But, but interesting. They really become, especially the Eastern population, very dependent oh. on human beings. And now the Western population, if we don't keep the nest boxes up, we lose the purple martins. I guess. Yeah. I found it so interesting how you were talking about like indigenous people and the photo of them in Florida. Yeah, yeah, I don't like that. I don't like that. Sorry, I don't like that particular illustration, but it's the only yeah. one I can find. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, not so much the illustration, but the ideas that you were presenting about yeah. why they might have had them there. And A, I loved that maybe it was also just because they enjoyed watching them, you know? Well, it could be, and, could be. Yeah, I mean, there's probably multiple reasons, like you were stating, and I, I don't know, I just found I mean, that... It wasn't unusual, uh, God, I mean, during the Second World War, the British, the English, ate a lot of small birds mm -hmm. because food shortage. Yeah. And I mean, uh, if you go back, uh, four and 20 blackbirds baked in a pie. Yeah. Oh, you know, yeah. <laughs> that was true. They yeah. ate blackbirds, you know. Yeah, interesting. So uh, a lot of people in Europe uh, the French are quite happy to eat small songbirds as wow. delicacies. Oh, so, I never, yeah, I would have, yeah, I, so I don't know not, if I would have uh, ever connected those two. I mean, you go back several thousand years, it's just another food resource. Yeah, no, it's, yeah. it's true. Yeah, exactly. A lot of people. But the other one is it may have been also to keep insects down. They probably mm -hmm. help control yeah. the mosquitoes and other biting insects. Mm hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, Marissa just has a question in the comments. And if anyone else has any questions, feel free to either write them or you can um, unmute yourself um, or raise your hand. But I'm just going to read Marissa's comment really quick. Um, she said, on average, do you know how many purple martins nest at Maplewood Flats? So yeah, I know you had a, a few of those boxes because I saw one of them yeah. was number 50. Yeah, we have over 100 boxes. Oh. And we generally found that about 75 to 80 percent of the boxes uh, have a nest. Wow. So it's a pretty, pretty large colony. It, uh, 
there's a, I think it's Ladysmith on Vancouver Island is larger. Uh, this is certainly, Maplewood is the largest colony on mainland British mm -hmm. Columbia. But it is interesting that uh, I was on the Sunshine Coast oh God, 15 years ago at uh, Seashell mm -hmm. and Marina. And they had the nest boxes up in the marina. Wow. So people were walking by those nest boxes like within two or three feet of them. And the purple martins were coming and going quite happily. Aww. So they will accustom us, you know, they get used to people, mm -hmm. I guess, as long as the people don't interfere with them. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah exactly. Yeah. Because I know, yeah, exactly. Sometimes if you're around nests, the birds can definitely swoop. But if they're kind of accustomed to humans, they might feel a little more comfortable knowing they're not going to yeah, you know, be. Think, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's funny. It, and, and, and I guess if, if those birds return to that uh, seashell uh, marina every year, they're used to it, you know? They're used to seeing yeah. people walking by within a few feet. And uh, yeah. Whereas the birds at Maplewood, they freak out when you go out on the mudflats near their nests. No, totally. That that makes sense. Exactly. And, you know, I know that before um, this started, you were talking about how long you have been in conservation for, but how yeah. long exactly have you been, like, interested in um, purple martins and and kind of, when did you start kind of learning about them? I guess is my question. I, I didn't know much about purple martins at all until the early 1990s. Okay. And it, it actually came out of, uh, my interest came out of uh, the fact that bluebird nest box, box, let me get that right. Bluebird <laughs> nest box schemes <laughs> Say that were happening in the sense. interior. Yeah. And were being very successful for mountain and western bluebirds. Mm -hmm. And uh, eastern bluebirds, I think, back east. And also for European birds, there were similar schemes for different species in Europe. And as soon as the nest boxes went up, the birds took to them, you know, like it was a lack of nesting sites that was the problem. Mm -hmm. So uh, when Tom Plath turned up with this idea, hey, great idea, Tom. And it only, I think, uh, British Columbian Wildlife, uh, Wildlife Department, uh, Environment, uh, the uh, Canadian Wildlife Service, the Lynn Canyon Ecology Center, who I worked for, and Nature of Vancouver, I think we each put in 300 bucks in a kitty mm -hmm. and got the nest boxes made. Oh my God. <laughs> so, I mean, it wasn't, those first nest boxes were made out of red cedar. Mm -hmm. And uh, for 300 bucks, uh, well, four times 300 bucks. Hey, and they were really well made and they, uh, now we put those up, we didn't, we, we put them up, fixed them to stay up forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, they lasted for quite a number of years, the red cedar. But well, then we got into putting up boxes that could be put up and taken down every winter. Mm -hmm. And it sure expands their life. Really yeah, you were mentioning that. Yeah. Well, the winter yeah, red storms, cedar is a great rot resistant wood. Yeah. Well, the winter storms really hammer those boxes. You know? Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. And especially if they're exposed, kind of like on um, near water, at least uh, well, that, that probably salt water, gets salt. Yeah. yeah, but that's really and cool. Frost, that's really... And snow and wind and dolls <laughs> sitting on top of them and pooping on them. You know, yeah, every well, kind of <laughs> thing you can imagine. Yeah, it just yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's really cool. That's awesome. And yeah, um, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, I have a couple things to say. Just nice. um, uh, we have a habitat committee that's also been, uh, um, it was established about four years ago. And one of the things that um, the research subcommittee of which uh, Kevin's a member and Marissa, who's one of our new, new staff from the summer, um, and uh, uh, Chloe Hartley, who's the, uh, co the chair of the habitat committee, and Tom Flower, a board member who's um, helping with our, our re research. So they've been um, kind of reviewing, doing an inventory of all the research projects on site. And one of them uh, um, is around the Purple Martin colony because it's so important. And so we kind of put a hold on any banding um, just to make sure any of our procedures are, are 
uh, appropriate and that we have all the systems in place, but also acknowledging that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's such good work um, that we've been so involved in um, helping to um, help with the Purple Martin recovery. But through that work and, you know, Kevin's touched on it, I touched on it near the beginning, but through that we've also unintentionally excluded Tsleil-Waututh. And so um, I know that there's, um, there's been interest in terms of um, uh, removing the dolphins and replacing them because of the creosote. So there's um, health issues around that that we want to um, have a conversation with them. But it also means like, how can we do this in a way that is continuing to protect the, the colony, uh, doesn't endanger them? And how can we, and that's what we're looking with this year, um, with the help of people like Marissa is um, reaching out to Tsleil-Waututh and involving them in the removal of the nest boxes, doing the observations that um, we've had a practice of doing, and, um, and, uh, and then cleaning them and then putting them away for the, the winter and then returning them uh, before they, the birds return. So putting them back up on it. And it's a huge project. And as Kevin has outlined in his, his um, presentation, uh, there are people like Mike Mont and Ernie and uh, many volunteers have been involved over the years. So Mike Mont's outboard motor. That's right. So, so we're trying to, um, for this year in the process that like taking down those nest boxes, there's over a hundred. I don't know if you mentioned that detail, Kevin, yeah. you probably did, but um, you know, and I got, because of COVID, we had a very small volunteer team that helped Ernie remove this, uh, sorry, put them back up <laughs> in March before the birds returned. Um, but I can tell you that it is a huge project. Um, but it's also can be done with three to four people safely. And so it's, it's something that we will be working to engage Tsleil-Waututh, um, perhaps some of their youth as part of their education, their outdoor education. So um, just, uh, just um, letting people know that that's kind of our, our um, approach, um, but also, you know, ensuring that we're all practicing the, proper kind of monitoring and and uh, ensuring the health of the birds are all part of that so I think I may have uh, given the wrong size they're actually 19 centimeters seven and a half inches in length I think I might have said six inches and I think uh, you said seven did I good yeah. I think, look at yeah. her paying attention <laughs> <laughs> I can remember and, uh, numbers pretty well. <laughs> they certainly, uh, I mean, I, I like to think that this bird is linked with the uh, original people of this coast and that they probably were delighted in the spring to hear the, uh, the song of the Purple Martins when they returned in April and stayed for a long, hot summer. And I guess they were sad in September, early September when the birds left. And one wonders, I'm sure they must have had stories and uh, ideas around where those birds went to for the winter. Uh. It would be really interesting to know if, if any of those uh, ideas survive. It's unfortunate that so much was lost by uh, stupidity on the behalf of settlers. <laughs> I think that might be a really cool way though to engage with Slave with Tooth almost is maybe contact some elders and see if mm -hmm. anyone maybe does know that. Well, well I think your own your own background too. Uh, mm -hmm. Purple Martins were probably around that yeah. part of the valley as well. I'm gonna ask know? my uh, grandma for sure when I see her yeah. this weekend because yeah. she yeah. has I you know sometimes she doesn't always tell us but then when we well, ask no. Then yeah. she'll always be like, oh, I remember. And yeah. we're like, well, okay, sweet. Well, you know, I'm finding as I get older, I forget things. And, and then yeah. somebody will jog my memory and I'll remember. Like, totally. It happened just recently with the, 
Port of Vancouver archives. Yeah. I've known about that for years and I'd sort of forgotten about it. And then something happened and uh, somebody, oh, oh, the archives, Vancouver. <laughs> They've got archives, you know. Yeah, yeah exactly. The colony, the colony is up the inlet as well, too, right? So. Um, oh yes. They've also reestablished um, them at uh, Port. At Port Coquitlam. Yes. Cool. Yes. Yeah, the, the, so they're managing yeah, they're them there. That's and, awesome. And, and yeah. before 1800, mm -hmm. uh, they were all through the Fraser Valley, and I, yeah. you know, I would think that there was such a you couldn't help but see and hear them. So I'm sure that some of the na nations yeah. must have had. Uh, oh, for sure. Yeah. You know, Actually, just, have a, you know, ideas about where they went in the winter and all sorts of things. Exactly. I actually have a really cool book and maybe I'll um, take a picture and post it later because I don't know where it is, but yeah. it's all on these uh, indigenous like legends or stories on different birds. Yeah. So it's like well, sorry, it's sort of stories and legends is i mean yes there's something it doesn't quite seem to cover i think in some yeah. cases they're more uh almost more scientifically based yeah sometimes. you know oral histories we can call them oral history perfect yeah exactly yes. i yes. know I'm, I'm always trying to veer away from yeah, the I mean, legend like a, Irwin would say stories and legends is a bit settler yeah um, exactly you know? <laughs> exactly it's yeah. so true but it's, it's always in our vernacular to to use these words we grew up with and then well, all of a sudden it. i was yeah. like yeah. that's actually a little offensive to call it a legend yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. i like i like what oral history is a good was that mm -hmm. what you said? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah but i'll look at the book because if there yeah. is anything even maybe just on swallows or something then It'd be cool to share. Yeah. Anyone, anyone else have any other questions? Yeah, I know. So sorry for. <laughs> okay. No, it's all great. It's all great. Oh. Oh, there's Erwin. <laughs> there he is. Oh. oh yeah. What do you think, Erwin, of ca calling the like legends and stories is a bit sort of settlerish, <laughs> oral history better? <laughs> oh, I think you're muted, Erwin. Yeah, he is muted. He looks good muted. <laughs> <laughs> positionality, that's called positionality. You know, so a white person might think, oh, noble legends of those savages. But then, you know, so it doesn't necessarily mean that that's what's implied, but that's often the tr trap. So oral history would, would be better. Yeah, I mean, they're all at the end of the day. The irony is that language is is an evolving process. So five years ago, ten years ago, you know, five years from now, oral history might feel like, oh, that's a a, a bastardized anthropological term. You know, could mm -hmm. be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good Whether point. Other terms that come from some like, tradition of anthropology or. Yeah, things are always changing, and um, yeah, it can be you know tricky to stay updated. But I think. Even myself, like I'm constantly learning. I think we're all on our own learning journeys. And um, as long as we're trying, and I think that's kind of what's most important, right? But yeah, I think um, definitely even asking other Indigenous people what, what, how would they consider that, right? Like, and yeah. there's probably a variety of people who think a variety of things, but at the end of the day, it's just amazing to like learn, especially from elders and uh, knowledge keepers. Like, when they do share that information, uh, it can be really, I don't know beautiful to to then be able to carry that on you know like as a, a youth or a young person to then go okay now i can share this with my young ones in the future which i don't know i like that well it would really be nice to find out if any of the other nations in the fraser valley the lower fraser floodplain areas had any oral history mm -hmm. yeah yeah well that, that is still, now we know that still remember you know yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, there's. The, are you ask? Are you asking question? The Kevin, Kevin, uh, question, Kevin. If the local nations have those intact oral histories, a great research project or something. Yeah, no. There's. The, I think there's. There's hundreds. There's a few. There's. There'd be several thousand. I mean, it's really accumulation, right? That mm -hmm. when you consider how how effective the colonial system was to steal the kids from oh. their school. That's, yeah. That was a really effective tool to break those 
oral oral histories, yep. but it but they nevertheless they they survived. So those stories continue. Like the Slayoteth have their origin story. There's uh, information about all kinds of different spaces and locations, and then there's some like the Squamish can benefit from Major Matthews. There's a a settler who did extensive interviews with Squamish Nation family members. So there's a particular skewed knowledge base in Vancouver art, uh, anthropology that looks at Major Matthews, but in fact that's one perspective because he interviewed only select individuals. It's not that he did representative sampling of, of oral histories, he could show some stories and so they become more important over other ones that may not have been documented through books or history books or so it's very mm -hmm. tricky, it's very complicated. Hell of a lot must have been lost. A lot must have been lost. Yeah. Well, I was uh, taking some classes at SFU and they were saying that a lot of nations, like a lot of anthropologists and um, people at that time, if they weren't interested in your nation, a lot of times you don't have a lot of uh, books written about it um, because, you know, maybe a nation like Haida was so um, studied and researched where a lot of other smaller nations they weren't and so there's a lot missing there and it's it is it's sad um and heartbreaking but i think it's really nice when uh when we do have the knowledge we do and we can continue that through listening and visiting and yeah different ways like that and, and it's amazing like as you were saying you know sometimes if you ask the elders it'll jog their memory and they'll say oh yeah my <laughs> grandmother did tell me something Oh, yeah. My grandfather told me something. Yeah. You know, There's sometimes I have to ask my grandma multiple times, like, and my cousin just goes, "How do you find that information from her?" And I'm like, "Cause I've asked the same questions, yeah. probably yeah. ten times, and maybe the eighth time she'll remember it, and then I'll be like, so I, you know, either write it down or record her, and yeah, sometimes it's about just being patient and also just persistent and and knowing that they have." 80 plus years sometimes of well, knowledge you're not always going to remember and then if if it's something from their grandparents yeah that's going back another yeah exactly 80 years you know yeah. which yeah, is a long time it know? is it and, really is and some, i've noticed weird. this too getting older somebody will ask me something and i won't i won't remember i won't know the answer and then in the middle of the night i'll wake up and i'll remember <laughs> the bloody answer so you know yeah exactly to all elderly people uh, they uh, they can't remember something right now but yeah 24 maybe. hours from now hey <laughs> yeah exactly no and i think that's why it's important to spend lots of time with those in our lives um because yeah you never know yeah. yeah i didn't think Irwin was trying to say something i don't know sorry if i i was just, I was just saying that's how that's why uh, lee miracle's writing is so popular because she tries to capture the kind of knowledge of pre-contact and mm -hmm. and, uh, and and has a kind of a attunement to those poetries and and the, the oral stories, um, and she writes it in a particular way that's not so archaeological or anthropological. So it's more yeah. like she's doing creative writing yeah. of these stories. And it blends you're blending. You don't know whether you're 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 reading her interpreting a story that she's heard or she's actually creating her own poetry yeah um, but, but she's got she has poetry from the flats and i think kevin when we look back at 49 years ago when leonard when leonard you know made that comment about saving the flats for future generations of slavitoth yeah um i mean then they called them barred barred indian band members right it wasn't even called right. yeah mm -hmm. um but then leonard was there and sue was there and that is only 49 years ago, but that now is, that becomes an archive, archival piece that we can then point to, because you made the point, Kevin, that essentially when we saved the flats, we stole it for the second time. Oh, that's right. And, yeah. They didn't mean and to. the proof of that. <laughs> yeah. But the you proof know, it wasn't, of that. It wasn't done on purpose. But yeah. That, <laughs> done to protect wildlife, but, proof, but we but did the it. Proof of that is, the proof of that is 20 years before 1993, right? Before the flats were created. 20 years before we have on record Leonard saying to the film camera from the National wow. Film Board, wouldn't it be great for this to be saved for future generations? So he's actually on record challenging us not to do what we did 20 years later. And now why it's so in interesting, this archaeological, uh, sorry, this uh, cultural heritage project that we want to do, kind of mirroring the, bar looking at the Barge Channel 
the fuel storage bunker, that big cement bunker just on the south side of the nursery, uh, and then you walk down to the waterfront, what are you walking on? Are you walking on existing fill, new fill? Are you walking on destroyed habitat? Uh, then you look, then, then white folks would fetishize over the kind of industrial heritage. But in fact, it's, it, what heritage? It's, it, it, there's so many fluid mixes of heritages and stories here. And, and to tell the industrial heritage, we could say, oh, we don't wanna, we don't wanna go there. Like we don't want a Gassy Jack sculpture. You know, we don't want to memorialize that. But in fact, by recognizing and talking openly about the air, airport, the air, the airplane strip that was there, the gas station that was there, barge channel, and we look at the horror of those photos that Kirsten found for the, the you know, the, from the north looking down to the flats from 19, what is it, the 30s when the when the the gravel oh, was there. McBride. It's an amazing photo of destruction. So, so we actually want to show that photo because it shows what the Slayotuff community had to deal with meters away from their homes was this mine site, which now we're like, oh, this is the beautiful Maplewood Flats. Well, actually, that's not the whole story. So it's, it's a, we're, we're going to do this proposal to Heritage BC at the end of the month. And it's a fascinating, complicated project because what story do we tell? And what's, do we hide them or no? Hiding the truth actually hides some of the ugliness of the settler occupation. So it's complicated. Yeah. One, one, one of the things that always comes to my mind is that imagine watching the intertidal flats and salt marshes being destroyed. And that's where you got your food. Like you're actually sitting there and you see part of the salt marsh where you got bulbs or berries whatever and you were sort of gardening there and some asshole comes in with a machine and destroys the whole thing in front of you yeah yeah for series I mean, of years yeah that must have just taken some people's hearts and sort of gone and you're not allowed you're not allowed to hire a lawyer because it's illegal for an indig yeah. indigenous person in Canada oh, to hire you a don't lawyer. exist really yeah, listening to stories from my grandma growing up, it's um, and what her dad did um, was like um, kind of he would go um, around to different um, bands and stole donation um, to kind of collect money so they'd be able to hire um, lawyers. And then oftentimes, yeah, like you said, it was impossible. Uh, many times it was like illegal for you to hire a lawyer. And then if you could find someone that you know, would do it, you know, you faced a whole lot of other bureaucracy, bureaucracy and, and rules and legislation that's just continually stopping you. And um, yeah, it's, it's really tough to hear those stories, but at the same time, like you were saying, Erwin, we need to hear that because, you know, um, and I think um, Marissa probably knows when we were listening today at the uh, decolonization um, webinar, that that stuff is important to be talking about. It's uncomfortable, but it's important, right? I just wanna add, yeah, the, that um, the BC Museums Association had a conference Nicole and I were sitting in on. And that one that she just mentioned, was something stood out to me, there was um, some Squamish elders um, or elder, and she uh, said that we should be the ancestors. We should start thinking about what kind of ancestors, ancestors do we wanna be? for our descendants and the land for the future. And I, that really stuck with me, so yeah. Yeah, yeah there's a, um, a Cowitzen made brand and uh, the person who runs it always goes, be a good ancestor, <laughs> and I, I like that. Like, okay, actually we can be thinking about this right now, yeah. Um, I, I originally immigrated from Ireland to here. Wow. And the Irish history is interesting in that prior to medieval kings of England, Ireland was a series of small nations or tribes or clans and mm -hmm. they were very similar in many ways to yeah. same the as Welsh and uh, Scotland and the same with yeah. the Welsh and the same with the Scots mm -hmm. and it was a policy of the English government to get rid of the culture mm -hmm. of the Irish Celtic Irish, Celtic Scots, and the Celtic Welsh. Yeah. And they had 
I mean, they practiced what they did here on the Irish Celts, the Welsh, and the Scottish Celts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Now, unfortunately, nice. the Celts from those countries came to North America and did the same thing <laughs> to nations here. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. I know. Uh, E.g., I... Mr. McDonald. <laughs> yeah. Of the whiskey. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Another another thing that from that conference uh, was that in terms of like decolon decolonizing, um, about how it's not really about the end product. It's about like there. It's it was it was the metaphor was because there was a museum. So it's like you go through the process and you you talk to and you involve indigenous peoples and that's that's decolonization and the perk is just the picture on the wall at the end so i feel like a lot of this conversation is is really valuable for maybe the people that are listening to it's it's very reflective I, and i i really enjoy this conversation <laughs> yeah well it's it's you know even when we're talking about you can be talking about many things right in today's world nature or architecture or city planning and it really does come down to how are we moving forward as a people and um how are we um i guess lifting up the voices that for so long have not been heard have not been listened to and i think that when we're talking about anything it can relate back to colonization and or conservatory or conservation because it is it's in inherent in those things right so yeah oh well i know we're all pretty much past time but i want to say a huge thank you to kevin uh for kevin bell for that beautiful presentation i really appreciated that i hope everyone at home appreciated that uh it was really um educational and now i'm going to be paying a lot more attention um when i'm walking around uh you know Burrard Inlet and um say which is territory just to kind of pay attention to the birds and and see if I can myself spot some purple martin so uh Kevin I raise my hands to you thank you so much thank you. and um thank you Leanne and Marissa and Erwin also and anyone else here from Maplewood Flats for attending and uh for all of you at home and I hope you guys all have an, a, a nice night a cozy meal and um hopefully uh, a good weekend as well so yeah awesome thank thanks you so thank you cool. thanks kevin nice thank you and hey, a parting thought here's to uh, president harris <laughs> soon i i'm my well, fingers crossed <laughs> president <laughs> harris sorry let's do more of these conversations yes. yeah yes. i like it it's awesome <laughs> It's also with Zoom, we're not, with COVID, we're not getting the Maplewood Flats community. We're getting these one-off conversations. Yeah. Lots of people, hundreds of people are watching them on Facebook, the videos. But if we actually had a discussion like this with 50 people. Exactly. Yeah. And then we could break out into little workout uh, small groups. Yeah. So five or 10 people could be in a small group for 20 minutes talking about the subject from the speaker and then come back into the big group. Uh, I love then, I kind of used to do similar things at school. So I definitely would love to yep. plan that in the future because yeah it is kind of nice also to do it on zoom because uh yeah we can't really be having these conversations right now but i'm gonna have a damn good moderator <laughs> yeah <laughs> not like not like the last two moderators yeah in the Trump presidential and... debate <laughs> oh. okay yeah, well okay. awesome have a i'm good wishing day. good energy to everyone and Great. thank you so much night, night.